Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, constitution and the economy. And at the outset, can I just remind Parliament that in order to get as many people in as possible, I will need short and succinct questions and answers to match, please. Question number one, Margaret McCulloch. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact would be on Scotland's economy of the proposed centralisation of HM Revenue and Customs Offices. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney, please. Trade Officer, as indicated in my letter to Margaret McCulloch on the 27th of January, I know that we share concerns about the organisational change programme which HMRC announced on the 12th of November. Over a 10-year period, the number of HMRC jobs in Scotland is estimated to reduce by around 825 as local offices are closed and centralised in Edinburgh and Glasgow. This is a worrying situation for staff, those they serve and the local economies concerned. We are fully committed to working with all interested parties at local, national and UK level, including the trade unions, to, in order to mitigate the impact of HMRC office closures in Scotland. Thank you. Margaret McCulloch. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and also for the Deputy First Minister's correspondence with me about the impact of the planned HMRC closure in my region. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what assistance and what plans you actually have the Scottish Government has to provide to trade unions and community le leaders to help build a case for the retention of HMRC's offices in the Central Belt and for the continuation of employment for all tax office workers in Cumbernauld and East Kilbride? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I, I signal my willingness today to, um, as I indicated in my earlier answer, to work with all relevant parties to make that case. We have been in touch with the United Kingdom Government on uh, these issues. Uh, we have uh, raised the issues with the, um, with the UK Government and uh, particularly with HMRC to make the case for the maintenance of the uh, expertise that is contained within these facilities. And that will be essential in marshalling the arguments that will be necessary to put in place a credible proposition that would encourage HMRC to take, um, uh, take a different approach. Many thanks. Supplementary, Linda Fabiani. Thank you. To, to ask the Cabinet Secretary if he is aware that the announced closure date of the HMRC operation in East Kilbride is dependent upon the lease negotiations for the building, uh, the building having been disposed of by Gordon Brown to a subsidiary of a company whose financial arrangements enable it to avoid paying UK corporation tax. Will he impress upon the relevant UK Minister the importance of maintaining the East Kilbride operation and that negotiation with the Guernsey-based Maple Group must be robust. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, uh, I think Linda Fabiani highlights some of the practical and detailed issues that will be challenging in addressing some of these issues. Um, but I uh, reiterate the points I made in my earlier answer that the government will be willing to work with all interested parties to marshal um, a strong case to preserve these facilities and this employment. It is vital that these specialist skills that are available in these centres are able to be deployed to uh, undertake the very important work of tax collection and to the management of those resources um, for the utilisation to support public services in Scotland. Thank you. Question number two is Mark MacDonald. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support the Aberdeen economy. Minister Ferguson, please. The downturn in the oil and gas sector globally highlights the challenges the region faces, but there are also significant opportunities, presiding officer, for the future. On 1 February, the Scottish Government announced further support to the oil and gas sector, including a new £12 million transition training fund and £12.5 million for oil and gas innovation and further business support. The Scottish Government believes that Aberdeen and the North East are central to driving future growth and prosperity in Scotland, and that's why, Presiding Officer, we recently committed to investing £125 million through a city-region deal agreement, which will be matched by the UK Government. The Scottish Government believes that to achieve a more significant step change in the economy of the North East, that more can be done, and that is why we also announced a further £254 million of uh, additional Scottish Government investment <coughs> to help cement Aberdeen as one of the world's leading cities for investment and business. This funding is paving the way for massive investment in innovation, digital connectivity 
and infrastructure across the region. Thank you, Mark McDonald. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I welcome the near half billion pound of investment that he has highlighted there, on top of the close to a billion pounds being invested in the AWPR and also the uh, improvements to the Aberdeen uh, to Inverness rail line. But can he, uh, does he share my disappointment? that the sum total that the broad shoulders of the United Kingdom have so far been able to cough up uh, is £125 million for the city deal and £20 million to support oil and gas industry, uh, <coughs> amounting to £145 million. And does he agree with me that the Chancellor needs to make meaningful changes in his March budget to support the industry and the wider economy of the city? Well, yes, we, we did seek uh, the, the UK Government make a greater contribution and that was not successful. Uh, the second part of his question, uh, it is absolutely imperative that uh, George Osborne, in the spring budget, uses that opportunity to announce a substantial package of tax measures. Uh, not because that's the major issue of facing operators at the moment, it is survival. Uh, but uh, if uh, the Chancellor does provide a substantial package of tax reduction measures, that will be the loudest, clearest signal of a boost of confidence in this key sector and absolutely central uh, to giving the industry a second wind, as one of the leaders I met on Monday put it. Briefly, please, Lewis MacDonald. Does the Minister acknowledge that the bid for the Aberdeen City deal contains projects to the value of more than a billion pounds in devolved areas which the Scottish Government has yet to agree to support? Does he accept that it is in these devolved areas that the city deal falls so far short of what was hoped for? And will he therefore indicate the government's intention uh, to bring forward funding for these projects at the earliest possible date? Minister. Uh, well, I'm afraid to say I don't agree with, with that uh, presentation of the facts. And indeed, I was able for myself to see some of the investment taking place in Aberdeen and the North East on, on uh, Sunday and Monday uh, during a visit to Aberdeen, I was able to see the Inveramsey Bridge nearing completion. I was able to discuss the Western Peripheral Road going ahead on budget from memory £754 million. I was able to meet Sir Ian Wood and discuss the opportunity North East and discuss the exciting opportunities not only in oil and gas but in food and drink and in life sciences. I was able to learn about the investment of the Scottish Government in other areas such as health and housing. So I really do think that Mr Macdonald's characterisation of the position, position is unnecessarily churlish as well as being inaccurate. Audrey, please. Minister, can I just point out that if you turn away from your microphone then the Chamber can't hear you. Question number three, Hans Ala Malik. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment has it made on how the reductions in the local government budget settlement could impact on the economy and inequality. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the Scottish Government funding proposals for the coming financial year deliver a strong but challenging financial settlement for local government, taking into account the addition of £250 million to support the integration of health and social care. Next year's reduction in local authority overall estimated expenditure is less than 1%. I believe that such a reduction should have minimal impact on the economy or inequality, as Scotland's Council should be able to address these challenges from a healthy base, as local government funding has been rising in Scotland in recent years, with core funding protected and new money provided for additional responsibilities. Hans Adam Alec. Uh, thank you very much for the response. The Scottish Government has added to the Tory cuts and have squeezed local councils further. Glasgow City Council is facing a real terms cut of £64 million. I have already had several elderly minority ethnic constituents and minority organizations raise their concerns of the tripling of the cost of their day centers subject to, and subsequent job losses are also expected in the area. Does the minister agree with me that as resources are cut for special services, the government should assess the impact these cuts have on minority ethnic staff and services and also include at equality impact assessment to be carried out in all of these uh, before any further job cuts or services are lost Cabinet in that you. field. So, no, sir, the government's budget is uh, subjected to assessment for equality considerations as part of the budget process, and I published the, uh, the equality assessment along with the budget document, which I did in December. And, of course, I maintain my 
ongoing dialogue with the Equalities Budget Action Group, which is always a fruitful and thoughtful contribution to the budget process, and I warmly thank its members for the contribution they make to that assessment. Any specific decisions that are made on programmes um, are a matter for Glasgow City Council to determine the equality's impact of their decisions, and uh, they have duties that they have to fulfil, and I'm certain that Glasgow City Council will attend to those duties as part of their decision-making process. Many thanks. I call Jimmy Dee for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how much more the City of Edinburgh Council has received in funding for the current financial year, over and above what the funding formula would allocate? What are the level of reserves available to Edinburgh? And can he tell us how the local government settlement in Scotland compares to the cuts being imposed in councils south of the border? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the Government has taken two decisions that are material to the City of Edinburgh Council's funding. Um, one, of course, was negotiated with um, our dear late colleague um, Margot MacDonald um, in the very early years of this administration, where Margot MacDonald made the case for a capital city supplement, which in 2015-16 generated £3.9 million uh, for the City of Edinburgh, beyond the uh, allocations that should have been the case. Mr Reedy will also be aware of the application of the additional funding floor that I applied in the, in, earlier on in this Parliament, which in the current financial year generates £13.7 million pounds, uh, more the, for the City of Edinburgh Council than the funding formula would generate. Um, in the most recently available statistics, the City of Edinburgh Council had general reserves uh, totalling £123 million. Pounds. And, of course, uh, the... Uh, Parliament has considered the comparative uh, strength of local authority funding in Scotland uh, compared to the significant reductions that have taken place in uh, authorities south of the border, which creates a strong platform for local authorities in Scotland to undertake their financial planning, which has been part of the long-term commitment of this administration. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact on Scotland's future budgets would be of not adopting the index deduction per capita method as a block grant adjustment mechanism in the fiscal framework. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, Presiding officer, independent academics such as uh, Professor Anton Muscatelli have estimated that the proposals that uh, would take forward the, um, index, the, the levels deduction or index deduction uh, mechanism would reduce the budget of the Scottish Parliament by up to £7 billion over a 10-year period. Any mechanism that would systematically reduce the Scottish Government budget simply as a result of devolution and before the Scottish Government makes any policy choices is unacceptable and will not be agreed by the Scottish Government. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does I agree that the failure of the UK Government to agree to fairness and no detriment in delivering the fiscal framework will be a breach of faith regarding the vow made to the Scottish people pre-referendum, show the Prime Minister's promise to deliver the Smith Commission proposals to be false, and, as we approach another referendum, this time on Europe, that the words of the Prime Minister cannot be trusted? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we are at a, a very key moment in the fiscal framework discussions, and as the First Minister set out yesterday, um, the key issue in resolving the question of the block grant adjustment is the um, interpretation of the no detriment principle. Um, I am absolutely confident in my mind that the Smith Commission, when it made its recommendations in relation to the powers that were to be devolved, uh, was not volunteering for a systemic reduction in the Scottish block of expenditure as a consequence of the devolution of the powers. What it was agreeing to was the devolution of the powers on essentially a no better off, no worse off principle. When it came to the exercising of these powers, that is a different matter, where there is clearly um, a risk that has to be accepted by the Scottish Government, and we are prepared to accept that risk. But the no detriment principle is absolutely central to this discussion, and it hinges on the question of whether we should be better off or worse off um, as a consequence of the devolution of these powers. Now, if we adopt a mechanism other than index deduction per capita, then that is what will happen, and that's why it's unacceptable to the Scottish Government. A brief supplementary, please, Leslie Brennan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I just ask, uh, will the Minister just give us the assurance, give us an absolute assurance, that the Scottish Government will remain at the table until an agreement fair to all is secured? Cabinet Secretary. 
the, the Scottish Government is committed to these negotiations. Um, I have now taken part in nine meetings of the Joint Exchequer Committee. I do not think anybody could question the amount of time and energy and commitment I have put in to trying to resolve these questions. But what is clear is that the, we have a very difficult um, discussion to have to resolve the differences of interpretation that we have on the no detriment principle. Now, I am committed to continuing these discussions to get to an outcome that is fair to the people of Scotland and fair to the people of the United Kingdom, which the no detriment principle is, because neither Scotland nor the rest of the United Kingdom is better off or worse off as a consequence of the devolution of the, of the powers on the mechanism that I have advanced. Um, but the, what the Scottish Government will not sign up to is a mechanism that is damaging to the interests of the people of Scotland, which was not intended by the Smith Commission. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in finding an agreement on the fiscal framework. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I met the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on Monday for the ninth time with the intention of agreeing a fiscal framework for Scotland which meets the Smith Commission recommendations. Any agreement must be true to Smith and be fair to Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. It has not yet been possible to reach such an agreement, but, but both the Chief Secretary and I are committed to continuing to do so. We will continue to meet with a view to reaching agreement shortly. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I would uh, be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could highlight what the process would be if no deal could be reached before the dissolution of Parliament. For instance, could the discussion reconvene after the parliamentary elections in May? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, the objective of the Government is to secure agreement on the fiscal framework. Um, and that, I think, will be welcomed across the board, providing, of course, the agreement is acceptable to the Scottish Parliament. And that would enable a much wider discussion and debate around issues in connection with the exercising of the Smith powers, which, of course, the Government wishes to be able to do. Um, we, I have written to the convener of the Devolution for the Powers Committee, who had asked me to ensure that a fiscal framework agreement was available by the end of this week to enable the committee to properly consider its contents before um, it, it can, uh, before taking evidence from myself um, the week after the parliamentary recess next week. Uh, I have now written to Mr Crawford um, asking for the committee to identify what further flexibility it may have uh, to enable discussions to continue, to enable Parliament to have the proper opportunity that I wish Parliament to have uh, to, to fully scrutinise the contents of the fiscal framework. Many thanks. Briefly, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, surely it is clear to everyone except uh, the UK Government that population increases are a relevant factor when analysing the growth uh, of tax receipts. Is it not therefore essential to focus on the growth uh, of the UK tax base per capita in order to uh, be true to the no detriment uh, principle, to treat England and Scotland or the Scotland and the rest of the UK on an equal footing and to avoid a situation where money is withdrawn uh, from Scotland simply because the English population is growing at a faster rate than ours. John Swinney. Uh, I agree unreservedly with the point that Mr Chisholm has made, and I think it's a, it's a, a cogent and well-articulated point. Um, Mr Chisholm will also be aware from his, ex from his extensive experience on these issues that the issue of population difference is already factored into the Barnett formula. So Scotland already carries risks in relation to the comparative a growth in our population with the rest of the United Kingdom as part of the Barnett formula. But the analysis that Mr Chisholm has presented to Parliament is absolutely accurate and I agree with it in, in, in its entirety. Many thanks. Question number six, Cara Hilton. To ask what discussions the Cabinet Secretary has had with Fife Council regarding its budget for 2016. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have not so far had direct discussions with Fife Council about its 2016 budget, but I have had a series of meetings with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, of which Fife Council is a member. I have also written to the Leader of Fife Council setting out the details of the 2016-17 Local Government Finance Settlement, and I have indicated to Councillor Ross that when I am in Fife for the meeting of the Tullis-Russell Task Force um, next week, I will also see him to discuss these issues. 
Thank you, Can um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Thanks to the choices made in the Scottish Government's budget, Fife Council now face an additional cut of £17 million on top of the £21 million already anticipated this year. To make up for these cuts, two thirds of people responding to Fife Council's budget consultation said that they'd be willing to pay a rise in council tax to protect local services. Yet yesterday, the leader of Fife Council, David Ross, has been forced to accept the Scottish, the Scottish Government's budget settlement thanks to the sanctions that Fife Gov Council would would face if it went along with the wishes of Fifers. The result is going to be job losses, cuts to third sector projects and cuts to our schools. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how slashing council budgets fits in with a commitment to local democracy and to fighting austerity? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the uh, local government finance settlement, um, when we take into account the investment that has been made in the integration of health and social care, which I think all of us accept is an integral part of local authority services, once that is taken into account, it represents a 1 per cent reduction in local authority revenue. Now, I think, we, I think we need to get a sense of perspective about some of the language that has been used on this particular issue. Second point is that when we look at the contents of the issues about which I have been concerned in the local government settlement, the integration of health and social care, the payment of the living wage to social care workers, the protection of the, teaching uh, the numbers of teachers to protect the pupil-teacher ratio and the freezing of the council tax, I think these are all material issues that matter to local residents in the delivery of their public services. And I have been anxious to ensure that we secure a local authority settlement that protects all of these items. Now, I am, appreciate the fact that uh, 32 local authorities have now indicated their willingness to accept the government's local authority settlement that enables us, that enables us now to proceed to the implementation of the local authority settlement. And what I think is surprising is that the Labour Party seems to be taking exception to an investment of £250 million in social care, to the, protection of the, to the payment of the living wage to members of staff in the social care sector, to ensuring that there is a council tax freeze. I thought the Labour Party Order, supported the existence of a council tax freeze. Many of their authorities were elected in 2012 on a commitment to freeze the council tax. And I would have thought maintaining the teaching population would have been critical to improving attainment within our schools. So I'm at a loss to understand why the Labour Party cannot support the approach the government has taken. Thank you. Question number seven, Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what the target is for access to superfast broadband in East Lothian by 2018 and whether it expects to achieve it. Cabinet Secretary, please. The Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme aims to deliver fibre broadband to at least 95 per cent of all homes and businesses in East Lothian by the end of 2017 and is on track to deliver this target. Commercial coverage alone would only have delivered fibre broadband to around 67 per cent of homes and businesses. Thank you. Ian Green. The fact of the matter is that nearly half of residents in East Lothian do not have access to superfast broadband, and just 57 per cent of premises in the county uh, have that access. So it seems extremely unlikely that the target the Cabinet Secretary has just described is going to be achieved by the end uh, of next year. Indeed, East Lothian is one of the worst figures in Scotland, better uh, really than only the very remote local authorities like Orkney, Shetland and the Highlands. Uh, will, therefore, the Cabinet Secretary take some action to prioritise getting East Lothian up to speed so that it can achieve the target he has just recommitted himself to? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look in detail at the points that um, Mr Gray makes, and uh, I, I may well raise them with BT when I see them at four o'clock this afternoon. But I want to reassure Mr Gray on a number of points. Uh, the first is that the commitment to at least 95 per cent of all homes and businesses in East Lothian um, having access to superfast broadband is a contractual commitment with, with BT, so it has to be fulfilled. And I assure Mr Gray it will be fulfilled uh, in terms of the contractual obligations. In terms of progress towards that, um, we have we already surpassed the target of 85 per cent coverage by the end of 2015. That target was met in June 2015. So the, the completion of this programme, I think, is, 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 is absolutely practical. Beyond that, there are, of course, the Mr Gray's constituency will have a range of different properties and homes um, that will not be covered by the 95 per cent assurance. And I can give them the commitment that the government is focusing increasingly on ensuring that those individuals are not, not disadvantaged by, being, um, uh, by not being part of the, the core programme just now. 
and that we are looking at the different technological and programme solutions that can ensure broadband is available to uh, all households and businesses as extensive as we can in Scotland. Thank you. Question number eight, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the expected impact of its draft budget 2016-17 on public services. Cabinet Secretary. Within a challenging financial settlement, this Government continues to provide the resources necessary to protect and reform our public services, ensuring that public resources better meet the needs of the people of Scotland. The Budget will increase the National Health Service budget by £500 million to around £13 billion, invest £250 million in the radical reform of health and social care, protect frontline police resource budget and deliver a pay rise for around 50,000 of Scotland's lowest paid workers. Our budget will equip the country for the future and lay the foundations for the reforms that will define the next Parliament. Thank you. Mary Fee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In my region, West Scotland, Renfrewshire Council has seen its budget cut by 13.5 million, North Ayrshire by 13.3 million and Inverclyde by 8.8 million. Can the Cabinet Secretary take this opportunity to explain to my constituents why he is implementing savage cuts to local authorities, which will have an impact on education provision, environmental services and recreational facilities, and will result in further job losses and under pressure local authorities right across West Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the uh, comments that um, Mary Fee made um, I think are misplaced in two respects. Uh, firstly, um, a 1 per cent reduction in local authority expenditure um, is, in my opinion, it, it's a stretch of the vocabulary to describe that as savage. What is savage, what is, what is, savage is a 27 per cent reduction in local authority Order, expenditure please. south of the border. That is Order. what savage is. Order. So that is the first point. The second is that Mary Fee's comments did not take into account the investment of £250 million yeah. in the reform of health and social care. Now, the Labour Party, now, I hear, well, I hear Mary Fee, I've, I've, heard, I've not been able to catch up, presiding officer, with all the shouting and muttering that's been going on to my left-hand side. Cabinet Secretary, time, I've called for order. Uh, but every time, every time I have mentioned the £250 million investment in the reform of health and social care, there has been muttering and moaning about it from my left-hand side. That is precisely what the Labour Party called for. They called for it a week before the budget debate that we should invest in health and social care. And I have done exactly that, to integrate these services, to make sure we can meet the needs of individuals, provide additional health and social care packages, and pay the living wage to social care workers. I would have thought the Labour Party might have supported that. Brief supplementary, please, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that in recent weeks Labour MSPs have suggested spending additional resources on building more homes, the NHS, climate change, local government, etc. Has the Cabinet Secretary be braided with any detail as to how the additional penny in tax Labour proposes to raise will be allocated to meeting their stated commitments, now totalling £5 billion? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think the, the, only, the only way I could rationalise that is to say that the Labour Party intends to spend the penny several times over. Question number nine, Annette Mill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to reform local government funding. Cabinet Secretary, please. <laughs> officer, we will bring forward plans for the reform of the present council tax, reflecting the principles of the Commission on Local Tax Reforms report. Enter into consultation with local government about the possible future assignation of a proportion of income tax receipts, thereby giving local authorities an incentive to boost economic growth in their areas and launch a review of the non-domestic rate system in Scotland before the end of this current parliamentary term. Nanette Mill. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. There is increasing concern that North East households, which already pay the highest council tax levels in Scotland, will be hit by newer, new higher bans proposed under the Commission on Local Tax Reform. Any change to the banding system, such as the introduction of two new top rate bans, could see council tax in Aberdeen increase from £2,461 a year to around £3,960. So whilst Aberdeen, which currently has the worst local authority funding settlement in the country, could soon see even higher council tax rates in Scotland eh, than the rest of Scotland. Are the Cabinet Secretary and his Government willing to see North East taxpayers disproportionately affected in this way? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the, the Government will take forward a considered uh, analysis of the Commission on Local Tax Reforms report and we will formulate our proposals accordingly within the context of that report and the issues that it raises. Um, as 
Uh, Dr Milne will be aware that the Government has put in place specific funding which is designed to address some of the, um, the, 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 the comparative position of funding in Aberdeen City um, with uh, other authorities in Scotland. Uh, the position on funding is, of course, a product of the local government distribution formula, which is jointly agreed between the government and local authorities within Scotland. But we have taken exceptional action to strengthen uh, local authority funding in the north east of Scotland, and we will pay particular attention to the issues and considerations of the economic situation of the north east of Scotland in any uh, review that we undertake. Thank you. Question number 10, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact would be of raising the Scottish rate of income tax to 11 per cent. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Um, following the UK spending review in November, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs updated its forecast for the direct effects of illustrative tax changes. It forecasted a one pence increase in the Scottish rate of income tax, allowing for potential behavioural responses to such a change. We would have raised £475 million for the tax year 2016 17. HMRC will review this forecast following the UK Government's budget in March. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And given that the opposition policy includes a £100 rebate or payment or benefit, we don't have any detail as to what this would be. What does the Cabinet Secretary suggest would be the likely administration cost to local government to administer such a scheme for low income earners to get that £100 payment or benefit or whatever it is? Cabinet Secretary. The first point to make, uh, Presiding Officer, is the, the acceptance that there is a need to put in place some form of mitigation demonstrates my point that this is a, a tax uh, change that will have a detrimental effect on the incomes of low-income households. And that's the principal consideration that I, I have given to this issue that uh, persuaded me not to raise the Scottish rate of income tax beyond 10 pence. The second point is that if, uh, and, and I marshalled this evidence to the Finance Committee uh, back in January, if there was to be some form of rebate put in place, there would have to be the legislative and operational basis for so doing. And I set out to the committee the fact that I do not believe it's within the legislative competence of this parliament to legislate for such a rebate. And I don't think the practical uh, issues are in place to enable it to be undertaken. As for the costs of it, well, we're several weeks into several. Are, are we several? No, it was just last week, actually. My goodness, doesn't time fly when we're enjoying ourselves? Um, just last week, the Labour Party set out their proposals. Uh, we are no further forward in understanding the detail of how they would propose to uh, deliver that rebate or the cost of the administration of that rebate. But I simply say, for comparative purposes, that the cost of uh, ensuring that council tax reduction and housing benefit are, um, uh, are paid to individuals in Scotland uh, costs £41.1 million, and that is, uh, uh, I think, a, a very illustrative number as to the cost of a rebate scheme of this type. Kezia Dogdale. Thank you, President Officer. The IPPR, um, the University of Stirling, and in particular David Iser, and the Resolution Foundation understand the policy, Finance Secretary. And the Resolution Foundation in particular say that the lowest four deciles in Scotland, 40% of the lowest paid Scots, would have no net uh, consequence of this policy. Does he think they are wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Well, th that's based on the heroic assumption that it's possible to make this rebate to be paid. And I, I simply I asked last week for the Labour Party to set out the detail of how this rebate would be paid. Now, if they want to be taken seriously, set out the detail. Not just imagine, not just hope that it might be able to be done. Tell us the detail and we'll explore it and examine it. But the Labour Party has to the Labour Party published a proposal Order, please. which said, Mr. Bibby, it said, Mr. Bibby, that the cost of administering this would be one million pounds. Now, I think Parliament and the public are entitled yeah, yeah. to understand the assumptions yeah. under that, underpinning that number, given that it costs £41 million to administer housing benefit and council reduction, which are comparable types of schemes to the one that's actually not even, not even touching the same number of cases. There's 800,000 cases potentially yeah. in the Labour Party rebate, and the council tax reduction and housing benefit only deal with half a million cases. Right. So a little bit before the leader of the Labour Party right. asks me questions on this point, a little bit of detail would be nice. Murdo Fraser. Thank you. Uh, raising the Scottish rate of income tax will take money out of the pockets of hard-working families across all income scales. Has the Scottish Government done any uh, assessment of the impact 
on Scottish economic growth of that spending power being lost to the economy. Cabinet Secretary. As part of the uh, consideration that I gave to the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, I looked at various questions around um, behavioural response informed by some of the analysis undertaken by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. And uh, some of that is illustrative on the point that uh, Mr Fraser raises, but uh, a much wider economic impact assessment uh, would, would cover further ground on the issues that he's raised. Question number 11, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy considers that the draft budget for 2016-17 provides adequate resources for general practice. Cabinet Secretary. In the draft budget for 2016-17, the Scottish Government has increased GP and primary care funding to £780.1 million, which includes £45 million investment in the Primary Care Development Fund. This will provide significant additional resource for general practice. The Scottish Government is also working to transform primary care, including developing new ways of working with multidisciplinary teams, reducing bureaucracy and working constructively with the GP workforce to ensure services are fit for the future and meet the needs of the people of Scotland. Siobhan McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The analysis by the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland show that under the current draft budget plans, the proportion of the budget devoted directly to general practice in Scotland is set to reduce further. I have received several representations from my constituents, some of whom are practising GPs, who have asked that the Scottish Government reassess the budget and ensure an additional 0.5 per cent is available for general practice in order to begin the move towards an 11 per cent share of the overall NHS budget. Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore give an undertaking to consider the issues raised by my constituents and work with colleagues in order to identify an appropriate way forward? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I recognise the importance of the uh, issues raised by Siobhan McMahon in relation to general practice. We engage actively with the Royal College of General Practice um, around these questions, and I know these issues have been um, aired in public, and uh, I certainly will reflect on the issues that have been raised by the Royal College uh, as part of the finalisation of the budget process. Thank you. Question number 12 has not been lodged. An explanation has been provided. So I turn to question number 13, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government how many jobs in Scotland it estimates have been lost as a result of the downturn in the oil and gas industry. Minister Fegshu. The number of redundancies or job consultations announced by oil and gas companies in Scotland has reached almost 10,000. The industry body Oil and Gas UK estimate the total employment supported by the sector across the UK has fallen by around 65,000 jobs. We continue to monitor the impact that low oil prices is having on the industry and its wider supply chain, and this will be discussed at the next Energy Jobs Task Force meeting, which takes place in March. The task force, which has helped to support more than 2,500 individuals and 100 employers through the current downturn, and will continue to support the industry to improve collaboration, cooperation and innovation. Last week, we also announced a £12 million transition training fund, which will augment the work of the task force and will offer grants to individuals to support their redeployment, presiding officer, through retraining or further education. Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Minister. Has he read this week's uh, State of the Industry report from the Trade Union Offshore Coordinating Group, which notes that insufficient up-to-date economic and labour market data are available to paint an accurate a picture of the impact the falling oil price has had on the Scottish economy and reflects recent increases in claimant count unemployment of as much as 80 per cent year on year in the North East. Will he now undertake at his hand to address this serious undercounting of the number of workers who have lost their jobs in order to allow government agencies to provide adequate support and to allow trade unions to do their job and protect their members? Cabinet uh, sorry, I uh, discussed on, on Monday of this week with Graeme Smith many of these issues, and this morning uh, I wrote to the newly formed offshore coordinating group to seek a meeting uh, to discuss these issues with them. These are extremely important issues. We are entirely agreed about that, uh, and therefore we are determined to continue to do everything practical within our power to assist those individuals who need assistance uh, and, of course, some of them may not seek employment or may find employment on their own efforts. But those who need it will get it. And that's why, presiding officer, 
the First Minister last Monday announced in Aberdeen the £12 million transition training fund and why I was in Aberdeen this Monday to discuss with a, a three different meetings with Sir Ian Wood, with the Industry Leadership Group uh, and with a meeting of senior representatives from the service companies uh, and why incidentally I was in Fort William yesterday uh, discussing uh, with the underwater diving centre in Fort William uh, uh, which uh, I believe is the best quality diving centre in the world how this training fund can be best deployed. So, you know, I think Mr. McDonald and myself uh, have similar objectives and I'm happy to continue to work with him to achieve them. Thank you. Very brief supplementary from Dennis Robertson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I was just to say, ask the Minister uh, what discussions are having with the oil and gas sector and the wider supply chain to ensure that the appropriate skills will be retained in the event of a recovery hopefully in the not-too-distant future. Briefly, please, Minister. Well, well I think Mr. Mr. Robertson has, uh, has identified an absolute key point, because if we lose skills, if we lose teams of uh, experts in fields such as uh, drilling, subsea, uh, exploration, divers, then when we emerge from the cycle, uh, as most experts predict will, of course, happen, uh, then we will not have the skills that we require uh, to serve an industry uh, which has an excellent future as well as a proud past of achievement. That is precisely why we have set up this £12 million transition training fund package and my job, uh, working with my colleagues in the Scottish Government, Aberdeen City Council, Oil and Gas UK, Opportunity North East, and the industry as a whole is to ensure that this money is used to maximum effect uh, as quickly as possible to help the people that Mr Robertson has identified require support uh, for the future of the industry. Thank you. That concludes questions this afternoon. Point of order, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Officer, I raise a point of order under Standing Orders Rule 7.2.3. Uh, under that rule, you may stop a member speaking if they depart from the subject of a debate. I seek your advice in relation to what you may judge in terms of 7.2.3, the subject of the debate we are about to start. The debate is entitled Scotland's Future Prosperity, while the terms of the motion are very substantially more narrowly drawn to refer only to education. Can you advise me... Whether the order, motion, please, title the of the motion, of order. which constitutes the title of the debate, and the terms of the motion stand equally in determining what you may consider to be the subject of the debate. In particular, not because I envisage this will be what will happen, uh, for future reference, would it be in order for someone to make a speech that referred to Scotland's future prosperity uh, but made no reference to education. And, presiding officer, it is, of course, a very important debate on education we're about to have, and I don't intend to diminish the importance of that subject. Many thanks. Order, please. So the member is correct that I can stop a member speaking if they depart from the subject of the debate. In fact, most members in the chamber will know that on occasion in members' debates I have been known to do so. The subject of the debate, however, is determined uh, by the terms of the motion and the amendments and not the title of the motion. I judge whether then a contribution is relevant in each case. And in this case that Mr Stevenson asks about, I would advise the member to refer to education in his contribution, given the terms of the motion and the amendments. Thank you. And we now turn to the next